Wellness Center. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Covey Wellness Center podcast, where we are trying to create some value for our clients and for people beyond even our clientele, just to access some mental health supports um, and to learn about different things that are going to help you holistically with your wellness. And so today with me is one of our therapists here at Covey Wellness Center, Nadira. She is going to be chatting with me about one of my most favorite topics, which is restorative self-care. And some of you will notice that um, in the title of the episode, we've asked like, what type of rest do you need? And I think this is really the question that we're going to start to explore together because sometimes we have a good night's sleep and we still feel exhausted. And so that doesn't make sense to us. Why are we experiencing this level of um disconnect with our energy levels and those kinds of things. So I think it's going to be something we can explore together. And this is part one of a two part series. So we'll get to some of the things today. And then we'll we'll pick up again next time uh, to continue the conversation. So I thought as a way of just um, introducing the topic, I'm curious, Nadira, because this came up. Um, I've been working with this concept of the seven types of rest from Sandra Dalton Smith's work and book Sacred Rest for a few years now, like basically since it came out. And then it was maybe a few weeks ago that you said to me, hey, Sarah, do you know anything about this? And we've been working together for a while. So this is kind of like an odd question to come up at this point when it's the topic that I speak on all the time. And yet here we are. And you're like, hey, do you know about this? (laughs) Like, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious because I've been working with it for so long that I, I'm not thinking of introducing it to people as new, but I'm curious what drew you to this concept? What, what brought you in? What intrigued you as far as exploring this some more? Yeah, well, you know what? I first heard about it about maybe a year ago. I had heard about it. One of my professors at Yorkville very briefly brought it up that, oh. you know, sometimes we don't recognize what, what is rest and, and really in the grand scheme of things, what is rest to each person? each of us right it can be very subjective um and then it was I dabbled in it a little bit here and there just kind of looking into it very very briefly and then it was right before the holidays this year and that's kind of when we touched on it together so I was chatting with a lot of family members I was chatting with a lot of clients you know holidays you've got some time off what are you planning to do for yourself and a lot of people said oh you know what I just need to rest I need to catch up on some sleep And I think a common misconception that we all have is that we heavily associate rest with sleep. And that's kind of where we draw our lines with rest is that it is sleep. And while sleep is, it's so core, it's so foundational as, as a necessity for us, it is not the only way that we can get rest. And in fact, there's so many different ways when coupled with sleep can be very restorative. So the idea of rest is not just to, still yourself and calm your body and just take some time for stability, but it's mm-hmm. to find what is restoration for you. How are you refilling yourself so that you're able to continue the next day feeling joyous and feeling fulfilled and feeling satisfied? Yeah. It's, that's so interesting because I, I often think about like, we think of rest, rest equals sleep instead of rest equals restoration like renewal, rejuvenation, like that's really the heart of what we're looking for in rest. And so it is really more about what is going to restore what is depleted. And so it's kind of like an energy management piece, like you're, um, you know, you're really thinking what have, how has my output matched my input? And where Mm -hmm. am I at with that? And what is the refilling that I need? And so Every day, sleep is probably the most um, obvious form of rest, right? Because we recognize what happens every day. We need to renew our sleep and Mm -hmm. we need, we have depleted energies. Our body needs to do all of its healing. It needs to get its REM cycle, all the stuff around sleep, which could be a totally own, you know, podcast on its own. But it's the most sort of common thing that people recognize as when I have a good night's sleep, I wake up feeling rested right? I wake up with more energy, more focus, more clarity. My body has been healed in the processes that happen while we're sleeping. And there's some really cool stuff that happens, but there are other things that when they happen or sometimes don't happen, like 
when we step away and have quiet, for example, mm -hmm. the the restorative component of that, we're we're not quantifying that as actually a type of rest that we need. Right. And so one of the ways I love to talk about this is this idea of like full breath living. So we're we're exhaling our energies out into the world with our families, with our jobs, with our snow shoveling, with our um, you know, cooking, our tasks, our all these things that require our energy to go out from our body and sort of this exhale. But and those are important things. Um, and we need those things in our lives because we need to be bringing ourselves into the world. But also we need things that are going to replenish that, restore that breath. So if we exhale, then we need inhale to resupport that breath and then to go out from there, right? Because we can't draw on anything in our lungs if we don't, if we haven't inhaled. And so there's this Absolutely. rhythmic, you know, energy management kind of approach to that. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. It's that input output cycle, right? So if you're, if you're inputting everything, if you're outputting everything to the people around you, your energy, your, your rest, whatever it is that you're putting out there, you're putting that on a constant from your day to day, whether it's with your peers, whether it's at work, whether it's with your spouse at home, you're yeah. constantly outputting that. The trick with the input bringing you back in is that it really does need to be intentional. Totally. So even with the full breath leaving, just recognizing, taking that deep, full breath, recognizing the importance of it, being intentional to take it in. If you're not intentional with it, you're putting out more than you're taking in or you're putting out and you're not really taking in very much. And so you're not restoring anything. And there's an interesting way too that that can kind of be, it's a, it's a more unique experience because you don't see this as often, but there is this sense in which people are actually sort of consumers in all the senses where they are bringing into themselves, like taking in so much information, taking in so, so much energy from others, really insular and self-focused in a way that almost like inflates them. Like if you think about a balloon being inflated by breath, like yeah. it's too much inhale in the sense of uh, it's not balanced with my engagement with the world, with my giving back. And we, and we can understand why that happens in some situations. Mm -hmm. For example, if someone's in a crisis, they might need to really have so much in, inhale and not and have very little output that can go out in that season. But sometimes we also can get where we we need to actually, there's an exhale component because we're, we, we've over, we've overdone our inhale, if you will. And we need to balance that. I think what we mostly see though, is the depletion on the other side. Yeah. Right. Where we've expended Absolutely. our energy and we need the restoration. And again, sleep is such a great example of that. We, we intuitively know what that means when we say, when we put it to a good night's sleep, but we don't, necessarily recognize it in other aspects of our lives so we do have to be intentional um Absolutely. so so I'm wondering like I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about some of the different kinds of rest from again Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith's work her book that came out is called Sacred Rest um we do have that always it's one I always stock here at Covey Wellness Center because it's a go-to resource for so many people and she you know her story is that she's a medical doctor. People kept coming into her saying, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And she started to say, well, you know, well, this person's tired is not this person's tired. So how do I treat this? Like, how do I help people actually get the rest they need in this, in the areas that they're fatigued? And she started to do some research around that. So I wonder if you want to just talk a little bit about that component, um, you know, of her research and how she came up with the ideas and maybe a little bit about what those different rests were that she identified in her practice. Absolutely. So kind of the biggest thing that really intrigued me with this is that, you know, so clients are coming in and really what I like to do with them is build a toolbox of strategies. So multiple strategies, they may all be beneficial to them at some point, but they may not all work for every situational factor. So one of the right. questions I was getting is, how do you always recognize what strategy to use? It's mm. really leaning into yourself. So very similar when it comes to feeling tired or trying to rest. How do you know what strategy is going to target the type of rest that you're requiring? Mm -hmm. And so taking a look at that a little bit further. So 
Sandra did a lot of research and she really broke it down into multiple categories. And, and mm -hmm. these categories are really the, the grand schemes of where to place rest. And each one has their own strategies, um, but really try and identify what rest do you, do you need? What, where, what is the rest that you require? Where does your energy need to be in this moment? So I'll read them all off and then we can go a little bit into them. But the and first just, one is- Let me just pause you oh, there sorry. for a second, Nadir. Just before you do that, I just want to let people know there is a, a free self-assessment. Yeah. Um, it's not a psychological assessment. It's just a self-assessment tool, a checklist that allows you to go through in some of these categories and get kind of a, a sense in terms of some numbers about where your rest is most depleted. And so as you're listening, if you're like, oh, I don't know how to assess that, there is a tool, we'll put that in the show notes um, where you can link to it and um, you know that's available. And so as you're listening, you might tweak on a few, but, and there's some that you might expect right off the hop because they're predictable. But there's other ones that you maybe have never even thought about and you wouldn't know how to assess, assess pardon me, if that is a, challenge for you if that is an area that's depleting you so i uh, just want to put that out there before we name them off because people might be furiously you know wanting to write notes or driving in their car <laughs> we'll send some resources and you'll be able to to access this stuff after you've listened so anyway take it away nadira with with running us through absolutely i mean even with that test the the results usually come back within 24 and 48 hours so you mm -hmm. do get some some factual information in your hands fairly quickly which is which is a great part of it mm -hmm. The and first it's free. one is, it's free. and it's free, Yeah, even better. Yeah. <laughs> so the first one is your physical rest. And I think that's probably the most obvious one. And that's the category that sleep really falls into. So when we think about rest, we, we generally think about the physical rest, feeling our bodies. And we'll go into the passive and the active component into it when we go a little bit deeper. But the physical rest is probably the most obvious one that we typically go to. And it might be like your client was sharing before Christmas, like that's the one that they think is me. I'm tired. I must need more yeah. sleep. Like that's the logical interpretation sleep. of it. If I sleep more, I'll feel better. But how many people have been in that situation where they've actually slept so much that yeah. they are, it's not changing their fatigue. It might even be making it worse, right? By oversleeping. Absolutely. Um, and so there's, there's, uh, some, some interesting connections that we draw around that automatically, like you say, um, that may not be it. And, um, and I think that's, in, that's important to distinguish. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even napping during the day, we think of napping as a way to find our sleep, but it could actually be an avoidance strategy that we're doing. So then when we wake up from that nap, we're not feeling restored. We're not feeling rested. We might even be feeling yeah even more tired than before we, we decided to take that nap. Yeah, I love, I love that because what we're really saying is not every strategy, just because it's a mental health strategy or because it's a self-care strategy, actually produces the outcome that we want it to produce. Absolutely. And so we're really having to be curious about that and collect our own data. You know, is this strategy I'm using effective to the outcome I want? If I take a nap, is my energy restored? Do I return to my focus? And uh, are there parameters if I change, you know, for little behavioral experiments around that, if I change how long I'm napping, does that make a difference? Mm -hmm. You know, if I only nap this long, then I get that energy. But if I go past this point, but for some people, like you say, if that's just a coping strategy to escape, then at the end of that nap, nothing has shifted for them in a way that's actually restorative. And so we have to have our, you know, our eyes open to how, how these things play out for us individually, which is why it's good to, to have a number of different strategies that we can draw from to really find what's, what's working for me. Like some people have power naps and they're like, I'm like a different person. Other people yeah. are like, I can't do that. That's okay. That may not be even in the physical rest realm. They may, that may not be what's going to help you with your physical rest even though it's a physical rest strategy. So we have to keep an open mind about that and really tailor for the, for the client. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's keep rolling through here. Yeah. So the second one is mental rest, which I think is probably another very obvious one as well. Right. So you're just, you're feeling clouded, you're feeling flustered in your head. It's hard to navigate and organize your thoughts. 
this one's a big one that we go through quite often. And I think it's one that does get talked about, maybe not to the same extent as physical, but it is one of the more obvious ones as well. And it's, it's really about um, like the activity of your mind, yeah. you know, and the ability to, you know, if, to restore that to stillness or to quiet, to quiet the mind. And people know like yeah. that analogy of the hamster wheel. And that could be a hamster wheel of worry and rumination, or that could be a hamster wheel of ideas and what's next. You know, there's lots of ways that our minds just, or it could be a to-do list, right? There's so many different things that could be occupying our mental space and drawing energy from our brain capacity. And so we're needing rest in that. It's tiresome. That hamster wheel is just going. If it never stops, we're going to feel fatigued and it's going to be hard cognitively. So uh, it's again, it's not always the same things causing that form of rest, but it is that taxation of our mental capacity. Absolutely. And one of the biggest indicators for mental rest is even your ability to recall information. Are you able to recall information? Are you able to really decipher the information going through your head? And if you're finding that there's maybe a challenge associated with that when you yeah. don't always necessarily have that challenge, it could be an indicator that your your mental rest is is maybe facing a little bit of a deficit and, and that's yeah. where some attention needs to be sorted. Yeah. That sort of feeling like you're dropping balls or forgetting things yeah. or have a mental fog. Like there's lots of reasons, of course, that we could be experiencing that, but certainly one of them could be that you're just, your brain, you're expecting more from your brain without having pauses to that. And we will talk folks as we're going through, we'll give you the overview, but we'll talk more about some strategies, things people can try that might be more in part two, um, but we will get to them. So we're giving you an overview now, and then we'll talk about some ways to address them. Um, you know, if we don't get to that today, it'll be next time. Okay, third one. Okay, so the third one is your social rest. And I think this one could be a little bit confusing, because when we talk about social rest, it's not necessarily taking a rest from social environments, being around social people. Right. But it's about the people in your life. Do they replenish you? Mm. Do you give your energy to them and feel like you're getting that energy back? And this could be for introverts and extroverts. And maybe introverts take a little bit longer to replenish that energy. And that's that's okay. It's how you're replenishing that social energy that really matters. Right. And choosing the people that are part of that. Because some people will absolutely deplete your energy, whether you're an extrovert or not. Right? Right. Um, Absolutely. And even though you love to be with people, there might be a depletion in that because it's a really tough relationship or um, because there's some strain or because it's just so many people at a big event or something. So mm -hmm. a, again, being intentional, monitoring that, thinking about, do, do I have life giving people yeah. in balance with time away, time alone in the, in the, rhythm that I need in the full breath that I need around that. Yeah. Um, but I think a big part of this can be, uh, you know, the lack of social connection. That's something we're seeing so much as we're trying to reintegrate post pandemic, lack of actual social presence of other people in your lives is typically more where we're seeing the depletion than the mm -hmm. alternative, because we've had so much isolation and time away. Yeah. There's a bit of that, like, again, too much of that is kind of, you know, gotten out of balance with our right. connection with others. So yeah. Yeah. Social rest is interesting. Um, it's, it's not something maybe people always think about like, where's my fatigue coming mm -hmm. from? I'm not connecting with people. No, you know, no. and we know so much research around social support is like so convincing that there's power from being in connection mm -hmm. with people. Um, as long as those people are intentionally chosen and, and, you know, you're aware of that exchange of energy that happens. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Okay. What are we at? Number four? Number four. So Number the next four. one is spiritual rest, which mm -hmm. this one's very interesting. And I mean, you can look at the spiritual rest for many different lenses, but it's really about your own belief systems, your, your ability to feel like you belong, a sense of community and that connections with people for a greater purpose, a greater, uh, maybe a greater mm -hmm. good. Yeah. One of the things I liked about this description is sort of, it's this, this sense of meaningfulness. Like if we think yeah. about like existential questions, like how do you answer mm -hmm. those questions of meaning and purpose? And do you have a connection to what that meaning making paradigm is? And so for lots of people, that's 
more of a um, an organized religious kind of based connection. But for lots of people, mm -hmm. it may be a more loosely um, or a broadly defined spirituality or connection mm -hmm. with nature or the universe. And so there's lots of ways that people can interpret this. Um, but it can't be dismissed. There is a sense in which people need to have those the connection to something bigger and broader and more meaningful than just them as a you know a, a solo human being in the in the sea of billions of people you know um that there's a meaning making component and i think it's hard because some people don't consider themselves very spiritual but they might actually be depleted in their energy because they haven't found that and so it's a really great spot to encourage people to explore spirituality to ask those questions and to see that that's a big part of their own you know well-being you know yeah and and to to honor that in themselves it may be something that people are not as easily connected uh within themselves so i don't know any other thoughts on spiritual rest from you nadira from your perspective yeah so one of the one of the uh, examples that i heard this come out of is people who really do enjoy their jobs but they're so overworked mm. that their sense of purpose maybe isn't as strong or as great as it was before okay. so i mean doctors nurses teachers even your your sense of purpose you know you're doing a greater good you're belonging to a community that has a purpose but it could be that you're lacking the spiritual rest and you're not seeing that purpose as clearly as you maybe were before right you've lost a sense of vision yeah you've lost you've lost Absolutely. your why for why you're mm -hmm. doing and we could see that even in our field like it's easy when yeah. you're supporting people and helping professions where you can become you know fatigued because of the compassion you're putting out there into the world and the trauma that you're carrying alongside of people um, you can kind of lose sight of that like oh my gosh like this is a heavy thing why am I doing this and you can see how that would just bring down your energy level but if you have the sense that this is like um, significant because it's something that you feel called to do for example um, mm -hmm. You know, for me, my story is very much that I felt that God brought me out of teaching into psychotherapy. And when I get back to that vision and that purposefulness and feeling that this is something sacred that I'm doing, this work fits within my faith paradigm, that makes a huge difference as to my energy level, right? And even just staying grounded in that as we go about our days, whatever that is. That's yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Each one of these have to be that intentional check-in. You have to be making sure that you're checking in with this to make sure that you're attending to it at, at, at all obstacles of life. I mean, if something big comes around, such as a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people were facing different rest deficits in many different, many mm -hmm. different areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it was being laid off, whether it's having to listen to news outcomes, whether it's the lack of social interactions, those affect many of the different mm -hmm types of rest and so checking in with it constantly mm. even when there's big events around it's very important to make sure you're doing that intentional replenishing and i think in what's coming up for me as you're saying that is that like grief can be um a really depleting thing and i think grief is sometimes yeah. tied to various forms of rest sometimes you're not physically sleeping well obviously mm -hmm. or, you know emotionally you're depleted but i think grief when people go through grief of all kinds and, and the pandemic was absolutely a, a, had its own grief threads through that because of the loss of so many things, um, mm -hmm. not just the loss of, of life or loved ones, but also just the loss of, of, of freedoms, of businesses, of connection. Absolutely. Like there was just so much. And I think that relates that grief can somehow tie in also to our spiritual rest yeah. because grief causes us to ask some questions, you know, big questions about life and big questions about meaning when something's lost that we've maybe held on to for identity or for security, we have to, we have to make sense of those experiences in light of some kind of a paradigm of belief. And it, you know, it brings about those existential questions. And so it's very possible that some of that journey is also feeding into a depletion, um, or, or maybe it's being renewed for some people, mm -hmm. they may have had a restoration of faith or spiritual, you know, perspectives through the pandemic, because they returned to it as a result of those things. Absolutely. So there's lots of different ways to think about this. But yeah, okay, number five, 
right? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. number five is your sensory rest. And this is one that I found a lot of people were maybe a little surprised about and, and kind of oh. questioning what is that sensory rest? Well, it's really just your focusing again on the input and the output. What are you taking in constantly? What is the, mm-hmm. what is your phone doing to you? What is your email, your work email constantly dinging? Mm-hmm. Do you work in an environment that is very sensory heavy, mm-hmm. right? So maybe even a call center, there's phones going around. Is it like a, an office, a clinic somewhere where there's always a buzzing or fluorescent mm-hmm. lights or whatever it may be mm-hmm. sensory input is a big one being on zoom calls all the time yeah and you're constantly at mercy of the devices around you whether it is a technological device whether it's uh, noises and background noises mm-hmm. i mean somebody who works at maybe a vet clinic it's all the barking while they love animals at some point it could be a lot for them as well mm-hmm yeah, it's interesting because we often see this too with people who work in like factories or construction yeah. positions where there's just a constant noise. And um, it, and really, if we think break it down to, this is where your five senses are overloaded. Mm-hmm. So if we think about being depleted in this area, it's like we were depleted because it's too much blue screens, which is what's coming in through our eyes. So our eyes get tired, right? This is that, this is that category. If we have too much noise, that's our ears, right? If we're, um, if we're bristled up against, like, if you can imagine, um, uh, like walking through a woods and having like a bunch of yeah. um, branches like bristling against you and you're sort of like oh stop touching me like there's this can happen even for like young moms who have babies yeah. and kids who are crawling all over them all the time I mean people who are listening who are moms they know that experience of just feeling like stop touching me like I yeah. need to just have some calm because I'm oversensitized to that that skin, that sensory, you know, the feeling of touch, um, you know, and it can be the opposite, of course, too. It's like, maybe we don't have enough touch in our lives. Maybe we don't um, have things that we put our eyes on that are restful for us, or we don't have opportunities to, to even just close our eyes and take a moment where we are moving away from that visual stimulation, right? We're we definitely had a lot of this sensory stuff come up with the zoom online world of, of all the things through the pandemic. Um, But if you think about all of your five senses, is there an overstimulation of that or an Mm -hmm. understimulation of that? What's needed there restoratively? Um, Because we just, we don't often have, when people say things like, I just need a few minutes Mm-hmm. Often I think that means I just need to step out of the chaos that is my yeah. my kids running around and my dog. I love that example of my dogs barking, my fluorescent. I just need to put the lights down a little yeah. bit, maybe wrap up in a cozy, you know, uh, blanket or have a hot bath or something that's just soothing the senses and bringing us out of that hyper arousal stimulation of our sensory input. It's just too, it can just be too much, too much repetitive, too much where we don't have an opportunity to turn it off. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when we think about sensory rest, I mean, the person who who needs that sensory rest, they're waking up in the beginning of the day and they're they're feeling fine, right? So if we think about the balloon again, throughout the day, you're taking more, mm-hmm. you're taking a lot more sensory in. So you're filling that balloon slowly and surely throughout the day, but it gets to a certain point where that balloon may be a little tight now, right? There's no more room to take in anymore. Mm-hmm. You might be on the verge of popping, right? So you're feeling that overload. Throughout the day, you're probably getting more irritable, more agitated. And that's a clear mm-hmm. indicator that, you know, there could be some sensory overstimulation going on. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people would say it's just, it's too much. It's too much. Like mm-hmm. that's how they would describe it when there's yeah. a sensory overload. Um, and so it is interesting also to think of ways that we can soothe our senses and restore mm-hmm. them intentionally, right? So like, yeah. I have a friend, he's going to know who he is, but I won't name him, who worked in a pickle <laughs> factory, okay, a pickle factory for like years and years as a young person. And you can imagine like the sights and sounds and smells and things that would come out of a pickle factory. And it would be, that would be a lot for your sensory over like a lot of vinegar, a lot of garlic, a lot of things. Yeah. And so, you know, what could, and a lot of noise and clanging and machines and all that kind of stuff, but what could that person do when they step outside of work 
to to restore sort of equilibrium in their system right and it might be intentionally shifting what they're smelling it might be using uh, essential oils it might be getting outside to fresh air it might be um you know quieting any noise whatsoever and just being in in stillness it might be sitting with their eyes shut for 10 minutes and doing some deep breathing and and maybe a meditation that's calming the nervous system in terms of that mm -hmm. sensory input so you know that that's a silly example maybe but i think there's a lot to be said for the fact that we have environments that are constantly you know taxing on us Mm -hmm. um, and Absolutely. so we need to think about how, what the impacts are of that. And we can make some deliberate choices in our homes or our offices or spaces where we can do that. I'm, I'm thinking of your work too, Nadira, uh, your previous work in the education system, working with yeah. um, special needs kids. And I would think this is a pretty common thing for them to have a challenge with sensory input, with overload. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing about sensory is that you have to be able to recognize it. And a lot of kids with special needs, they, they kind of know where their, their stopping ground for that is, or they may not know. And so being very careful at what all the inputs are. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever had a day where it was so difficult that when you drive home, you're driving home in silence and didn't even mm -hmm. realize it until you get home. Like so it's you don't kind put of like your radio where, on or you don't put your podcast no. on because you're just like, I and just you might not realize noise. It. Mm -hmm. you just can't have any more noise so with a lot of those kids it was getting to the point where they were just feeling so overwhelmed with all the stimulation going on that maybe that's when we'd have outbursts or that's when we'd have some kind mm -hmm. of behavioral activation at that point because it got to the point where going back to the balloon maybe the balloon popped at that point it was taking mm -hmm. in so much mm -hmm. so recognizing having again that intentional check-in of when are you at your barrier where is your limitation and being mm -hmm. able to attend to that before it gets there so any tools or resources that start to bring that stimulation down throughout the day so mm -hmm. that you let out some of that air from the balloon before it gets to the point where it's tight and ready to pop. And I, I think it's fair to say, too, with any of these depletions, although I'll, we'll speak sort of specifically in terms of sensory rest, there are cumulative effects of this, too. Like sometimes yeah. we're not aware of the taxation of that on the daily right? It might be that you've worked in that factory for 10 years and now you're starting to have a real, like almost like a repetitive injury strain from a sensory standpoint that didn't bother you before, but somehow that's where you've reached it. So it's not necessarily in a given day, but it might be in a season or it might be over time mm -hmm. where your body's like, okay, that's enough of that. You know, again, repet I think of like a pitcher in baseball, like when they're, you know, they're pitching, 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 and then all of a sudden one time their shoulder gives out. Well, it wasn't that, that one pitch that they threw, right? It's that mm -hmm. repetitive, repetitive strain um, that can create that overload. And so there's this cumulative effect in all the categories of rest that we may not realize even in a given day that that's depleting us, but over time it's adding up and causing an overall uh, fatigue in our system, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Yeah. And when you're feeling a deficit in one, it could lead to a deficit in another as well, because now you're not attending to other areas of your mind, right? Or you're letting one area be in a deficit for so long that it's starting to influence other areas as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why those check-ins are very important. I mean, if we relate it back to things that we do on the regular for ourselves, I mean, showering, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> maybe you don't shower every day, but you make sure every couple of days that you do do that. And that's an important part of your routine checking in with yourself should really be like that. Maybe you don't have the opportunity to do it every day, but every couple of days it's a necessity or it should be a necessity mm -hmm. so that you feel cleansed, you feel replenished, check in with yourself, see what areas are needing replenishing, what areas are your energy is feeling depleted. And that's where you could start to implement strategies to make sure you don't get to any point where you are in a deficit. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say too, that, I mean, these are all things that we can manage, but you might be in a season where a couple of these are sort of off yeah. the charts depleted. You might need strategies that are attending to that far yeah. more regularly in that season than you might mm -hmm. otherwise in a maintenance season. Maybe you've just gone through a crisis and you're, um, you know, you're, you weren't able to sleep. Maybe you had a loved one in the hospital or something like that, and you weren't able to keep up with a regular sleep. Well, you might actually just need to reset and, and catch up on some of that depletion 
from that season. And so you are attending more to your physical rest needs in that season than you otherwise might because of the particulars of where you find your yourself and your circumstances. And so sometimes we, we increase our attention to that one area because that yeah. becomes, um, that's a really taxed area. That's a really fatigued area and it needs additional care um, in mm -hmm. a, you know, in a particular time. Yeah, absolutely. Number six. Okay. So number six is your emotional rest. So really your ability to be authentic, your ability to be honest with yourself and others, your ability to share and, and take in that, maybe those deep feelings of others as well. Mm -hmm. So really when it comes to your emotional rest, it's, it's, are you being authentic? Are you being honest with yourself? Are you able to, if somebody asks you how you're doing and you're not doing so great, are you able to be, say, you know, not, not really, this is what's going on and this is how I'm feeling. Are you hiding it? Are you avoiding it? Mm. Right. So that's when you be in your emotional rest deficit is when you aren't feeling the ability to share or aren't feeling the, the space, the comfort safe spot to share those with. Mm -hmm. So somebody who does well in their emotional rest, maybe may go home to their family or their significant other, and they can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. They might be somebody who goes to therapy so that they have that safe, valid spot where they can share and they can be heard. And they can be authentic, mm. but it's really about what is it for you? What is the emotional labor doing to you? And how can you replenish that? It's so interesting um, because you met, you mentioned therapy as one way of reestablishing like an emotional restorative um, practice for you. Mm -hmm. And what's coming to mind is that there are, there are some things that we do as strategies. And I think therapy is one of these and which is, which makes it as powerful as it is that actually touches on so many yeah. of these forms of rest. So, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking, for example, I'll, I'll often say, um, you know, to people, if you take a walk with a mm -hmm. friend and your pet in nature, you're, you're going to hit, you know, <laughs> this is a simple strategy, but it's hitting so many points of restoration for you. Yeah. And I think therapy is similar in the sense that you're, you're getting a meaningful social, social, social connection. Sorry, that was hard to say yeah. um, with a significant um, life giving other, if you're matched well mm -hmm. with a good therapist, you're getting a sense of sensory, like even at Covey Wellness Center, we've really tried to be sensitive to those sensory inputs. We've created an atmosphere that we can dim lights. We've created soft colors. We're in, like that. You're not going to get loud, intrusive noises. Like it's a very calming from a sensory standpoint, right? You can also um, do some activities that are going to bring mental calm. Often we do breath work mm -hmm. or meditation mm -hmm. as part of the therapy session. And so that settles the brain, settles the mind, right? We're often talking about spirituality and spiritual practices and existential questions and finding a greater sense of meaning or purposefulness. So that's a big part of it. Right. And, um, you know, there's all the, and of course, emotional support we've already alluded to. Um, and so you can really find strategies like working with a therapist that can replenish so many of those facets and those needs. And it's one strategy in a big toolkit. Obviously, therapy is not the only thing, but we believe really strongly in therapy <laughs> or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. But that's part of the power of it, right? Is that mm -hmm. it can attend to those depleted needs in so many areas, you know? And we see that with people. We see that when they come in, that so many of those places are soothed and they go out restored. They've had that conversation about their feelings they've been able to name it in a way they hadn't prior to coming in mm -hmm. right they've calmed to their mind and got some clarity they've connected with someone who believes in them and supports them like it's just it's really powerful and I don't I think I knew that intuitively but I think it's the first time I'm kind of naming why therapy is such a powerful intervention yeah. that way yeah in terms of this lens of like the seven types of rest mm -hmm. okay and number seven. And it even, oh, it takes us to our seventh one. I mean, the yeah. therapy in terms of creative rest. And oh, this yeah. is the one that I, I truly, truly enjoy is the creative rest and taking 
creative doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're artistic. It's it's finding beauty, finding beauty in nature, mm -hmm. finding beauty in any form, music, whether it's dance, but also your ability to problem solve. And that's where therapy really comes in handy mm -hmm. is that being able to separate some things so that you can organize your thoughts, organize your feelings and find solutions that are very catered to you. So if you're struggling mm -hmm. with problem solving, it could be an indicator that you're you're in a creative rest deficit. If you are someone who loves nature and you haven't been out in nature for a little bit, maybe the weather hasn't been great then and, and not having sun, not having a lot of sunlight, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. To really push you to go out. You could be in that creative rest deficit. It's really just finding the beauty around you and mm -hmm. being able to recognize it. And, and for some people it, you know, there, it's definitely related to the creative arts, but as you say, it's not only that, but this is a yeah. huge component that I think we neglect because it's an aspect sometimes of our lives that doesn't have utility, yeah. right? So it's like, we can't quantify or make it a, like a productive task on our lists to go and appreciate art. You know, I mm -hmm. love to go to the McMichael Art Gallery when I can. I haven't been in ages with COVID and all of that, but it has beautiful walking trails. It's not that far from here. Um, and obviously beautiful artwork from Group of Seven and other amazing artists. And you can't you can't really quantify that you can't really quantify the value of going to a concert or going to um an art um a ballet or something like that like it's hard to say like why that matters in the art sometimes because we have such a utilitarian culture and i think that's mm -hmm. why so many of us are depleted because we haven't raised this virtue up of the appreciation of beauty in such a way that we give ourselves permission to take a painting mm -hmm. class, you know, to go to a film series. Um, years ago, Jay and I used to go every year to um, TIFF, which is the film festival in Toronto. And it was just so interesting to engage with those ideas and appreciate the beauty in those films, you know? And, and again, it's very hard to really find the spaces where we have that, but when we've had an experience of it, we feel the restorations we're like oh that mattered because when i spent that afternoon like wasting time painting or playing around on my piano or um being out in nature and i don't have anything to show for it i do have restoration right and i yeah. think again it's one of these areas that sometimes we don't even realize we're fatigued in because it's not a high priority you know, in our culture. I'm, I'm sorry to say, I think there's lots of artists who are listening out there who will be like, yeah, preach it because that's what we're trying to do in the world is remind people of this, you know, high value. And that's why people create poetry and art is to bring people back to that. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's one that flies off. It falls off the radar of people They don't, um, they don't remember that this is really needed for them as a restorative practice, you know? And it could be something planned, like going to the TIFF festival. It could be something you do on the spot. I mean, it could be something like finding new recipes that you're going to enjoy. Yes. Right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think just creativity, like you say, it's, it's new ideas, new problem yeah. solving. It's appreciation of beauty. It's, it's enjoyment. It's um, inspiration. Right. And so um, I'm sure people who are listening are already starting to to put the pieces together about how how categories are interconnected, right? Because, um, you know, taking in a beautiful sunset while is while it's creatively restorative, it might also be spiritually restorative for people yeah. because it connects them to creator, it connects them to God, it connects them to um, this existential meaning making. You know, like that experience maybe so many of us have had at some point in our lives of looking up at a mm -hmm. a dark sky full of stars and being in awe and wonder well that's both creative and spiritual rest you know colliding and possibly others mm -hmm. as well depending on how you're thinking about it or the emotions that are coming up or who you're talking to while you're looking at the sky right so it's just it's fascinating um to think about all these different types yeah absolutely and we can be very fluid i mean just moving through each of them we can have very different strategies for each of them uh, and that's why it's really helpful to be able to check in with yourself. What am I feeling? What is it that I'm, 
what is it that I'm experiencing? What is it that I used to enjoy that maybe I'm not enjoying so much anymore? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest takeaway that I really want to hone in on listeners is that we tend to reserve rest for weekends or vacations. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, it can be very challenging to do that because then throughout the week, you're not giving yourself the time or the permission to rest. And it shouldn't be something reserved for later on when I, when I have the time, it's something that should be made more of a priority that, you know, I don't have a vacation for another two months, but I need the rest. And so this, these are areas that I'm going to try to attend to that or your weekends are busy and you're working. So you don't really get to rest on the weekends. You need to make sure if it's something that can be routine and it's, it can be little things here and there, Mm -hmm. then you're constantly starting to restore yourself instead of waiting until you're at a crash and have to do a lot more work to find that Mm -hmm. restoration. And that works with that full breath living analogy, because you can't just Mm -hmm. exhale all week and then a big gulpy inhale on the weekend and then exhale. It is rhythmic. And yes, there will be times where we, where we take deeper breaths as it were, right. Where we do, there's a little bit more of an increased inhale. Like I practice Sabbath and on my days of Sabbath, I try that they're far more inhale than exhale. Um, You know, but that's not going to be enough to sustain the entire week. If I don't have mindful, intentional practices through the week that replenish Mm -hmm. that, that output. And so it's finding those personal rhythms that work, you know, targeting the areas that are most depleted in different seasons and being really fluid and curious and intentional about all of that. So yeah, this is great. I am so passionate about, I really think that this lens is so helpful for people Mm -hmm. to really take stock and do a bit of an audit about where, where they might be in need of restoration. And so I would encourage you guys at home to do that, um, to really think about those seven areas and maybe even jot some things down. If you have a few minutes after this podcast, listen to this podcast and really look at where where you're at in terms of what is restorative and present in your life in those capacities and maybe what's depleting them. What are the exhales and inhales in the different capacities? And you might already have a sense right away of maybe two uh, that are like, oh, this is absolutely a need for me and I need to create some strategies for that. And so uh, we want to help you do that. We will talk more in particulars about that next time, right? Nadir, we'll Mm -hmm. carry that over to part two. But in the meantime, if this is a concept that you want to explore further, a great place to do that is in therapy. And of course, uh, Nadira and I are are really passionate about this particular lens, but building a a self-care practice that is um, holistically minded and, uh, you know, a full breath rhythm for your energy management. This is a big part of what we do as therapists with people in general Mm -hmm. is building those toolkits. So please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, any final things before we wrap up for today, Nadira, that you want to add, and then we'll tell people where they can find us in all the places. Yeah, just check in with yourselves. Make sure you get some kind of rest in any form. Slowly replenish yourself. And then next time we'll go into a little bit more strategies that, that can be like takeaways for, for anyone listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. I think even my my thought, my final thought would be, just to have that orientation of curiosity to see how things affect you. So notice how you feel before and after certain mm-hmm. things happen. Kind of like that in the way we know exactly with our physical rest. You know, have that um, have that sort of data collection orientation to other things that are doing. How do you feel before you go um, into that meeting with that friend? And how do you feel when you exit that meeting with that friend? Was it depleting? Was it life-giving? Was it a form of social rest? Was it actually emotionally draining? You know, and and look at it through that lens and see if you can discern um, even some of the things that you might already be doing that are depleting your rest and or that need to be increased to increase your rest in those areas. And so just having that mindset of watching for the, the evidence in your own life about it. That's awesome. Okay, well, I'm excited about our conversation. I know we got to wrap up for today, but I am excited about our conversation to pick up next time because there's more to say. Um, if you are looking for therapy support, um, we do in person and virtual here at Covey Wellness Center, and we do have an amazing uh, wellness bookshop that's open to the public Monday to Friday, nine to five, and Saturday, nine to three. 
and you do not have to have an appointment to access the wellness bookshop all kinds of products and resources there including Sandra Dalton Smith's book Sacred Rest which is a great resource if you want to do some work in this area and you're feeling like it's really resonating with your experience and your need right now um, we have it here we're here in Elmville super easy to find in all the places hubbywellnesscenter.com has a contact us form if you have any questions about our services or about the location um, you can you can reach out to us there it goes to our admin team Nadira is a part of that team she's a therapist and also um, the manager of our screening team here at Covey Wellness Center so you'll probably very likely be in touch with Nadira directly if you do reach out um, and we're in all the places Facebook Pinterest YouTube um, Instagram, uh, all Cubby Wellness Center. So if you search that up, you'll find us. And I hope that you do. And I hope that you found that this was helpful um, and that you're percolating on these topics. And I look forward to um, having you join us again next time. All right. Thanks so much again, Nadira. We'll Thank again. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. See you later.